the anabolic steroids, often abbreviated as simply steroids, are a family of hormones that comprises testosterone, which is nature's own anabolic steroid, so to speak, the original natural anabolic steroid, together with dozens and dozens of synthetic derivatives of testosterone that have been synthesized over the last 70 years. And they include, for example, uh, nandrolone, decadurabolin, methenolone, which we call anadrol, you call them NAPs here, uh, methandienone, which uh, is called D-ball or Dianabol, both in America and in the UK, stanozolol, winstrol, or winnies, uh, and numerous other synthetic derivatives. These drugs have a history going back about 70 years. In the late 1930s, testosterone was first isolated by chemists in Nazi Germany. And very soon after the discovery of testosterone, many synthetic variations on the testosterone molecule were quickly created. And it is even rumored that Hitler gave anabolic steroids to his SS officers um, in order to make them more aggressive, although not a piece of paper actually survives to validate whether that's true or not. Not long after the war, by the early 1950s, athletes had begun to discover that these drugs could produce dramatic improvements in muscle strength and athletic performance. And in 1954 was the first point where the Russians got busted for using steroids at the weightlifting championships in Vienna. And from the 1950s onward, steroids rapidly spread throughout the elite athletic world at the Olympic level and throughout the elite levels of bodybuilding and got to the point where routine testing for steroids had been inaugurated by the Montreal Olympics in the 60s. But it was not until about 1980 that steroids actually began to percolate out of the athletic world and onto the street, so to speak, to the point where ordinary rank and file men and boys were beginning to use these drugs in local gymnasiums. And that transition took place in America in the early 1980s and here probably closer to 1990. And then in the subsequent last couple of decades, steroid use has become widespread um, in Western countries. It's perhaps most pronounced in Scandinavia, interestingly enough, with, uh, British with the UK and other British Commonwealth countries and the United States sort of in the second rank, so to speak, possibly also with Brazil, then most other Western Europe, European countries and Latin American countries maybe in the third rank. And then with very, very little anabolic steroid use in the Far East. The steroid use is extremely rare um, in Gen's country of Japan or in Korea or in China. And the reasons for these differences between East and West are something that I will discuss uh, a little bit later in, in the course of this lecture. But the, the bottom line is that at this point now, in 2012, the great majority of steroid users are just ordinary men. The, the elite athletes are only a tiny fraction of the total number of steroid users, and the vast majority are just ordinary men um, in gyms throughout uh, the Western world. So why would people want to use this stuff? Well, there, there's basically three um, factors that I think collectively contribute to it. The first is that steroids are highly effective as I will show you momentarily. The second is that our Western cultural background um, supports uh, muscularity, rewards muscularity, and, and uh, equates muscularity with masculinity. And th this is a feature that also contributes to steroid use in Western countries. And then finally, as with any situation, uh, one has to have a population of individuals who are sort of at one extreme of the distribution namely individuals who have particular concern about their body image and their muscularity, as I will illustrate to you shortly. So first, steroids are dramatically effective. The medical community made a fool of itself for decades by claiming that steroids were not effective. And athletes knew perfectly well that the drugs were highly effective. And it was really not until the 1980s that the medical community begrudgingly conceded that they were wrong. But here, just to give you an idea, is Steve Reeves in the year of my birth, 1947, at the time that he won the Mr. America contest. This was the most muscular man in the world in 1947. 
Um, if you see, and this was a man who we know almost certainly had not used steroids because they didn't, uh, they were virtually unavailable at that point. Any man who is as lean as this man, but who is more muscular than this man and claims that he got that way naturally is probably lying. Here, here by comparison, is a modern two-bit body player who, bodybuilder who couldn't even win the Mr. America contest now. He has 30 or 40 more kilograms of muscle than Steve Reeves, and it's all attributable to chemicals. Here's another example. Again, notice particularly the dramatic size of the trapezius muscles on the back of his neck. Steroids tend to selectively increase the muscle mass of the upper body more than the lower body, and it creates this slightly unnatural uh, appearance with, with exaggerated musculature on the top. Same thing here, as you notice, th this guy's trapezii are not quite, as, not quite as dramatic. But now take a look by comparison at Steve Reeves. He has a completely normal neck. There's no massive trapezius muscle for him by comparison. So steroids not only allow you to gain huge amounts of muscle, but it, it tends to be particularly great in the upper body, which is very useful, for example, for hitting home runs in American baseball. Uh, and that's one of the reasons the steroids have become quite a scandal in American baseball, as some of you probably know. Here, going backwards in time again, here is Mr. America 1939. Mr. America 1939 would be lucky to take sixth place in the Mr. Essex County backup competition nowadays. <laughs> um, or Mr. America 1953, uh, 1956, sorry. Perfectly, perfectly respectable, but a pale shadow of what could be achieved with anabolic steroids by a modern steroid using bodybuilder, where if you take enough steroids, you can have a back that will look like a manta ray. Um, so, the bottom line is, this, steroids are highly effective. There's just no point in denying it. Um, kids know this, uh, and uh, there is no question that the drugs work extremely well. But, oh, and just also for loss of body fat, I threw this slide in because it shows that you can reduce body fat to extremely low levels. The reason that men have more muscle and less fat than women is that men have high levels of testosterone and men have very, uh, women have very low levels of testosterone. So if you take additional testosterone, you become more male than male, effectively, with, the, with, unusual, with exceptional leanness and exaggeration of the upper body musculature. But the effectiveness of steroids alone is not enough to trigger um, widespread use. You also need a cultural background that rewards and encourages muscularity. And our um, encouragement of muscularity or support of muscularity, so to speak, has been in the West, has become particularly pronounced, this emphasis on muscularity has become particularly pronounced over the last several decades. And one example of this is the evolution of what we call action toys. This is um, our favorite American action toy, G.I. Joe, his equivalent here is called Action Man. And as you can see, when G.I. Joe first appeared in 1964, he was a perfectly ordinary looking dude. If he were my height, he would have a normal chest, normal biceps and deltoids. But you can see that by 1995, G.I. Joe has started to put in a bit of time at the gym and has got, uh, gained a certain amount of biceps mass and even a few abdominal muscles. And by 1992, he's not only put in quite a bit of time at the gym, but perhaps has done a cycle or two uh, and now has 16 and a half inch biceps and a full six pack of abdominal muscles, uh, far removed from his 1964 counterpart. And this <coughs> evolution is even more dramatic with the miniature G.I. Joes that first appeared in America on the American market in 1982. <laughs> so on the left is the 1982 G.I. Joe grunt, who as you can see is a perfectly ordinary looking little infantryman. Then in 1991, his counterpart has become decidedly larger and more muscular. And then by 1997, we have the G.I. Joe Extreme, whose biceps are almost as big as his waist and has a scowl on his face to go with it. Um, and this same evolution has been present in many other action toys as well. Uh, for example, if we look at the, the Star Wars figures and look at Luke Skywalker, 
When Luke first uh, appeared at the time of the original Star Wars release in 1997, he was uh, 1977. He was a perfectly ordinary looking guy. But when Star Wars was re-released 20 years later, Luke had become dramatically more muscular. And the story is told that Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker, upon picking up the 1997 rendition of himself is said to have exclaimed, good God, they put me on steroids. <laughs> and the same, the same evolution has occurred, for example, for Han Solo, who once again goes from a very ordinary looking guy to a far more muscular counterpart. And again, it, I'm, I'll pass these around as long as you're careful not to lose them. Uh, <laughs> just, just send them, work their way up to the top and just make sure that they don't disappear. <laughs> um, and not only do we grow up seeing muscle in action figures, but we see muscle everywhere in Western culture. Uh, consider, for example, just ordinary advertisements in a magazine. Um, who would think of using muscle to advertise coffee liqueur or muscle to advertise cellular telephones or muscle to advertise ironing boards. <laughs> but we in the West are, are accustomed to this. We, we see images of muscularity everywhere when we go about our day in, in advertisements, in television dramas, in Hollywood movies, in cartoons, um, so that it is something that's quite integral to our culture. We grow up uh, you know, with this uh, culture that, that uh, gives a positive value on muscularity. And steroids, as a result, are not viewed in quite the same way as other drugs. For example, flying over on the airplane in the seat back pocket in the magazine, there's an ad for negotiating seminars where you can learn to do good business negotiating. And the people who do these seminars are saying that it's like steroids for your career. But they probably would be less successful if they said it's like marijuana for your career or <laughs> like heroin for your career. Um, or Giant post-it notes, you know, being advertised as, think of it as a post-it note on steroids. Again, less likely to be successful if it were advertised as a post-it note on cocaine. Uh, so there's a definite sort of positive spin on steroids because of this Western, very uh, powerful Western tradition of muscularity. And I would submit that this tradition of muscularity is not merely just in the last 30 or 40 years of G.I. Joe, but goes back for 2,000 years. Here, for example, is, is the Farnese statue of Heracles, presently in the Archaeological Museum in Naples, in Italy. Um, and the Italian anatomist, Bernardino Genga, in the late 17th century, created an anatomy textbook. And he went down to Naples and made a drawing of the Farnese Heracles, um, and th this drawing is now in, in the National Medical Library in, in the United States. And it is striking that Genga, doing a drawing 250 years before anabolic steroids were discovered, has, descri has depicted a body that looks eerily like a Mr. Universe contender today. And then you'll remember that I had mentioned in passing earlier that the Scandinavians have perhaps the greatest amount of steroid use of any country in the world. And one reason for that, I would suggest, is that Scandinavia has even more of a tradition of muscularity than we have, with the tradition of the Norse gods and Thor and Vulcan and the Vikings. And as an example of that, here is uh, Fusli's painting of uh, Thor battering the Midgard serpent. This is from the 13th century prose Edda. This painting is down in London, as a matter of fact. And again, Fusli painting 150 years before testosterone was discovered, has created a Thor that looks remarkably like a modern Mr. Universe contender. And take a look at his boatman, Hymir, who is asleep in the bow of the boat. Hymir is even bigger than Thor himself. But by contrast, you'll remember that I remarked that in the Far East, in, in Japan or China, that steroid use is extremely rare. And part of that may be because the Far East does not have a tradition of muscularity like ours. Uh, there is no equivalent of a Farnese Hercules statue in, in Eastern tradition. Here, for example, uh, this is from Gen's native country, are the, are the gods Izanagi and Izanami, who drew the island of Japan up out of the waves of the Pacific. And this is a 
a drawing of this that's, that's in our Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, as a matter of fact. And as you can see, Izanagi is a perfectly ordinary looking man with fully clothed, no additional muscle, nothing comparable to uh, Thor or to Hercules. And then here's another example. This is a uh, statue, one of the oldest wooden statues in the world, actually, from the Matsuo Shrine, about uh, 20 miles from Gen's house in Kyoto. And again, uh, this god is fully clothed, has no exaggerated musculature, nothing comparable to what we have in, in Western tradition. So I would suggest that the tradition of muscularity that we have had in the West for for centuries, and, and which has been particularly accelerated, if you will, over the last few decades, um, is an integral factor in the widespread use of steroids among Western men. But still, there's a third component that is necessary, um, and that is that you have to have some people who are particularly concerned with their body image. And this is a fact that I began to notice, particularly when I started doing research on steroids back in the 1980s. And I saw a number of men who had what they called bigorexia nervosa. Um, now, as many of you know, anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder primarily seen in young women, where women will look at themselves in the mirror and see themselves as fat, even though they are actually very young or even very lean or even emaciated. And I encountered guys who showed exactly the reverse of this syndrome, uh, reverse anorexia nervosa, if you will, who perceived themselves to be continuously small and wimpy, even though they were actually large and muscular, and no amount of muscularity was enough to satisfy them. And men who are at that end of the distribution, who are particularly concerned with body image and muscularity, are presumably the ones most likely to use anabolic steroids. And now to actually show you a little bit of scientific data, Gannon and I did a study um, back in uh, about a decade ago, it was published in 2006, where we recruited um, 89 experienced weightlifters, uh, men who could perform at least one repetition of a bench press with uh, 120 kilograms. And among these men, there were 41 who had never used steroids, 48 who had used steroids, who were in turn subdivided into 24 men who had used steroids only briefly for less than six months of total time in their lives, and 24 heavy users who had used steroids in many instances for years in their lives. And we then asked these three groups of men a series of questions. I said, well, first, have you ever been preoccupied that you were too small and needed to get bigger? Well, I can assure you as somebody who's lifted you know, for the last 30 years, that, that's almost ubiquitous if you lift weights regularly. Uh, so we had a large number of positive answers. But among the heavy users, virtually 100% answered yes to that question. So then we asked them a, a narrower question, which was, have you ever refused to take your shirt off in a public situation because you were afraid that you didn't look big enough? Only about 10% of the non-users had, had that degree of embarrassment, but almost half of the heavy users could recall instances where they had specifically avoided taking their shirt off <coughs> for fear that they were not big enough or muscular enough. And then we asked an even narrower question, which is, have you ever given up some pleasurable activity or something that you would normally have wanted to do simply because you were afraid that you didn't look big enough? And only two of the 41 non-users answered yes. But almost a third of the users could recall instances where they had relinquished an opportunity to go to a swimming pool or to the beach or to do some activity that they would have liked to do, but they deliberately relinquished it because they were afraid that they did not look big enough. So preoccupation with body image is a common factor that may help, in, in, uh, together with these other factors, to predispose some individuals to use steroids. And we then followed up on that in a, a large study, which we just published, it just came out in the journal Biological Psychiatry a few months ago. And we got a group this time of uh, about 230 men, of whom 102 had used steroids at some time, and about 130 had not, and gave them a rating scale where we asked them about body image concerns or muscularity concerns when they were young teenagers between the age of 13 and 16. And 
as you can see, the blue, uh, the, the upper blue line are people who had relatively low, the lower 50% of preoccupation with body image. The red line is men who had higher Kaplan-Meier curves. The, the men with the higher preoccupation in red were much more likely as the years went by to develop anabolic steroid use and uh, to the point where a large percentage of them had become users by the time they were 30. And the difference between these two curves, not surprisingly, is highly significant at, at well beyond the .001 level, showing that, that concern with body image is, is a major predictive factor um, as to who will take steroids and who will be content to lift weights without taking them. So in summary, you have highly effective drugs. You have a, a cultural climate that supports and, and rewards muscularity. And then within that group, you have individuals who are particularly uh, focused on body image and muscularity. And those three factors collectively lead to steroid use, which has become quite widespread, as I have described, throughout most of Western countries. So why should we worry about this? Well, as with all drugs, there are people who use the drug in a modest way to, uh, or in a casual way who don't really get into much of any trouble. But then at the other extreme of the distribution are people who get in quite a lot of trouble as a result of using the drug, much as is the case with alcohol or, or marijuana or numerous other drugs. So many individuals, so-called casual users, are content to take steroids for a few courses and then uh, eventually stop using them. But something like 30% go on to develop a pattern of more continuous uh, steroid use where they take the drugs almost continuously, sometimes with no spaces in between, and sometimes even in the face of adverse effects. Um, and the, the, uh, the pattern of taking steroids almost continuously is a cardinal feature of dependence. And very often as a result, of taking steroids for long periods of time, these individuals get withdrawal syndromes, as I will describe later after stopping uh, steroids, and then will quickly resume taking steroids in order to relieve those withdrawal syndromes. And in addition, steroid use and the associated gym culture can become a central feature of the person's lifestyle, uh, much in the way that people who become involved with other drugs, uh, who become dependent on other drugs, their life becomes gradually focused around the drug. Um, and then finally, as I had mentioned, um, a feature of dependence is that such individuals may continue taking steroids in spite of undesirable effects uh, that they perceive, but they, cannot, they still are reluctant to stop taking them. So again, and I wrote a couple of papers about this syndrome of steroid dependence, but we realized that it was critical to be able to develop some kind of an interview module so that you could get different scientists to agree on the diagnosis, to, so that you could have two different people who would interview the same person and would come out with the same diagnosis uh, to have what is known as inter-rater reliability. And so we created um, a proposed interview module for steroid dependence that covered nine aspects, uh, requiring ever higher doses, um, using the drug to, to relieve withdrawal syndromes, having the drug become a focus of one's life, continuing use despite adverse effects, many of the features that I just described. And having created this experimental interview module, we brought it to Middlesbrough because we had just been contacted by Joe Keen and Adam Nash to describe the evolving Lifeline project here. And we saw this as, as an ideal opportunity to do a pilot study of an interview to diagnose steroid dependence. So what we did is, is Joe ma managed to round up 40-odd guys in, the space, in an equally short space of time of seven or eight days. And they came in one by one. And, and, and each person was assigned either to Joe or to me for an interview, while the other one got a series of rating scales from Gen and from Adam Nash. Then we switched off halfway through. And the person interviewed by Joe would then be, get an identical interview from me with Joe and me being blinded to each other as, as to the diagnoses. And then the other person would get the usual rating scales. And as you can see, Joe and I achieved quite a high rate of inter-rated reliability that out of 42 men, 
for 34 of them, we agreed that they either did or did not have story dependence. So there are 15 where we both agreed that they did not, and 19 where we both agreed that they did, and only a handful on which we differed. So the interview showed quite high iterated reliability. And we then took those 34 people, the ones at the diagonal corners that are in red, those 34 people who, where we both agreed that they were or were not dependent, and looked at some of the other ratings that we obtained on them. First of all, the dependent users were older, but that's hardly surprising because obviously if you're older, you have had more time to use steroids and more chance to go on to develop dependence, whereas the younger ones were presumably less likely to have gotten that far along. And so it's not too surprising to find that the, the dependent ones were older. However, they had begun lifting weights at very much the same age. And the, the dependent users had started using steroids a little bit earlier, but only very slightly. The doses um, and lifetime use of steroids, of course, was dramatically different between the groups, as you would expect. The dependent users had logged a mean of about four years of steroid use as of the time that we saw them, whereas the non-dependent users had only had a, a mean of a mere 17 weeks of lifetime use. The dependent users, again, as you would expect, had used much larger maximum doses of steroids. Uh, to give you an idea of the magnitude of that figure, the, the normal male produces between 50 and 75 milligrams of testosterone in a week. So if you're taking 1,560 milligrams of testosterone, you're ta taking somewhere around 30 or 40 times the normal out output of testosterone. And also, there was an almost statistically significant difference between the dependent and non-dependent users in terms of the amount of money that they spent. That the non-dependent users spent about 4.4% of their annual income on the heaviest year of spending uh, for, for steroids as compared to about half that amount in the non-dependent users. Also, the dependent users were significantly more likely to have used other performance enhancing drugs, human growth hormone, uh, insulin, thyroid hormones, clenbuterol, peptides that were growth hormone releasers, and so forth. And they were a little bit more likely to have had dependence on some other type of drug as well. But again, that difference did not reach statistical significance. So finally, we had a series of questions that we posed to the dependent versus the non-dependent users, where uh, we had a series of questions where you had five physical health. And you had a choice from um, strongly positive, moderately positive, neutral, moderately negative, strongly negative. And on many of the indices, there was no difference between the groups. But you'll see that on social life, that the dependent users were, were somewhat more likely to say that it had a negative effect on social life. On sexual performance, there was quite a striking difference with zero of the non-dependent users uh, reporting any effect on sexual performance, but uh, almost a third of the dependent users saying that, that, that there had been a moderate or strongly negative effect on sexual performance. And this is from uh, potential suppression of normal testicular function, as I'll describe shortly. And then finally, the, the other item that produced a significant difference between the groups was mental health, with quite a number of the dependent users giving a, a negative score on the mental health question, as opposed to very few of the non-dependent users. And in most cases, those are people who had experienced depression upon stopping, uh, upon coming off of a course of steroids. And that's another phenomenon that I'll get back to uh, shortly. So we published that study in 2010 and have continued to look at the issue of steroid dependence in the future. But now, what risks are faced by people who do have steroid dependence. Why would this necessarily be dangerous? Well, the answer to that question is that science does not know most of the answers to that question. Uh, we, we know surprisingly little about the long-term dangers of steroids. And um, unfortunately, uh, as is the case with many forms of drug abuse, there are highly opinionated people on both sides of the aisle who are highly pro-steroid, highly anti-steroid, both of whom are unencumbered with scientific data to back up their positions. And we are only now groping towards some of the answers to these questions. Now, so what I'm saying 
would be much clearer about a decade from now. But still, we're in the infancy of these, of these uh, areas of research. If there were one single thing that worries me the most, it would probably be the cardiovascular effects of steroids. And what we have found in preliminary studies is that men who've been exposed to a, a lot of steroids over a long period of time are more prone to have so-called cardiomyopathy. And this is illustrated in these uh, tracings, which are from echocardiography, where the technician puts like a microphone on your chest and can get an image of the heart on the computer screen. On the top is a non-user. This is a man uh, from, from our local gym, actually, who um, was about 38 years old, has never used steroids, uh, an accomplished weightlifter. And you'll see that when the ventricle contracts, the, the large chamber of the heart contracts, it produces a, a tall, sharp contraction uh, with a peak of over the 58 mark. And on the color-enhanced image of the ventricle, you see that it's bright red, indicating that there's a, a, a strong, uniform, forceful ventricular contraction. Whereas here is a man of the same age who's a very extensive user. And as you can see, the, the, the contraction is not as forceful. It, it, it doesn't even quite hit the 46 level on, on, the, on the image. Um, and also the color enhanced ring, as you see, has much less of the bright red color. So that the ventricle is, is not beating as, as forcefully and coherently as that of the non-user. Now, whether that is attributable to the steroids, um, whether it is attributable to other drugs, uh, whether it varies from one person to another, there are many unanswered questions here. But this is at least enough to cause some concern. And in addition, the echocardiogram shows that the, the ventricle of the non-user is much more flexible and rubbery, that you see that there are sharp peaks and valleys here as the ventricle fills up and then empties and then fills back up and empties as it expands and contracts substantially. Whereas the ventricle of the user is more stiff. It, it doesn't have as big peaks and valleys um, because it's, it's more stiff and not as rubbery as, as uh, as in the non-user. And this may be attributable to some fibrous tissue that is, that is accumulated amidst the muscle. Now, again, we have no idea if this is a temporary effect or whether some of this is a permanent effect. Um, we had one case of a man my age who used steroids for the first time in his 60s. He runs a gym north of Boston who developed quite severe cardiomyopathy was seen by my colleagues at Mass General Hospital, stopped his cycle of steroids, and within a matter of months had recovered entirely. So it's at least partially reversible, but we don't know exactly whether it is fully reversible or not. And presently, Gen and I have a large grant from, from the United States government, from, from our National Institutes of Health, for two and a half million dollars to do a study over the next five years to look at cardiac function in about 170 men. Um, including both users and non-users. And indeed, I hope uh, that, that I will have some men from here in Middlesbrough who would be willing to come over to America because we can offer them most of the cost of their plane fare to come um, and, and to get this, this cardiac testing. So if you were to ask me about five years from today, I may have much better answers to these questions. But at this point, the jury is still out, as it is with many aspects of the long-term effects of steroids. So if I were to give you the sort of my second rank concern after cardiac, um, it would be the effects on the um, hypothalamic, what we call the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis. So normally, in a male, the uh, testis makes, manufactures testosterone and sperm cells. And it does so in response to signals that it gets from the pituitary gland in the brain which, which submits hormones called LH, which tells the testis to make testosterone, and FSH, which tells the testis to make sperm cells. And then the pituitary, in turn, is controlled by the hypothalamus, which submits releasing hormones to the pituitary. So what happens if you are taking steroids, especially taking quite a lot of steroids for a long time, is that the hypothalamus sees all of these steroids present in the body, and it concludes that there is an ample supply of steroids and absolutely no need to manufacture any more of them. And so it 
it turns off its hormones, shuts down the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland in turn causes the testis to fall asleep, so that the natural production of testosterone from the testis falls almost to zero. So then, if the user stops taking his steroids, especially if he stops abruptly after a long period of time, then suddenly the hypothalamus suddenly realizes that there's no longer any steroids in the system. It releases its hormones and screams for the testis to wake up and start manufacturing testosterone. But the testis has shrunk to half of its original size. The factories and cobwebs, the workers are, are on unemployment, and it can't go back and start instantaneously manufacturing testosterone again. This decreased levels of testosterone can persist for months months after stopping steroids in some people. Some people rebound very quickly and have no problem, but others, for reasons that we can't understand, will have prolonged periods of time where their testosterone levels are very, very low, and who will get tired and fatigued, they'll have no sex drive, uh, they'll sleep a lot, and, and obviously may be tempted to resume taking testosterone just to make the bad feelings go away. So this is another area that that is not fully understood by science and which may represent more of a problem than we would have thought 10 years ago. Um, and then finally, I guess if I had to rank sort of my third rank concern, it's the psychiatric effects. And most men don't get psychiatric effects from steroids, but for some reason that, that, that is poorly understood, a minority, a, a fairly small minority of men get quite a lot of psychiatric effects. And no one can understand why the majority of men don't get these problems and then an occasional man does. But for reasons that are not fully understood, there are some men who develop so-called hypomanic or manic symptoms, so they become um, irritable, uncharacteristically aggressive, uh, euphoric, grandiose, uh, exaggerated in self-confidence when they're on steroids. And then when coming off the steroids, a certain percentage of men develop depression, I mean, may, perhaps only 10%. It, it's, it's uncommon, but occasionally can be quite severe. And there are even occasional cases where, where uh, the odd man will get a severe depression and actually make a suicide attempt during steroid withdrawal. So we know these psychiatric disorders do occur, but we do not understand why only a small minority peop of people are vulnerable to them. And the dose probably has something to do with it. This is a study I did back in the late 1980s. And you can see that people who took low or medium doses of steroids, doses below the equivalent of 1,000 milligrams a week, rarely had these hypomanic reactions. Whereas the ones who were in the over 1,000 milligrams a week, almost a about a quarter of them had uh, clear mood changes of this nature. Um, the depressive episodes um, may be associated with hypogonadism. In other words, the people who take a long time for their testosterone levels to spring back to normal may be particularly vulnerable to these depressions. But it still is unclear that there are many pe guys who walk around with ridiculously low testosterone levels and don't feel depressed. Whereas some men will get low testosterone levels and, and get suicidally depressed for reasons that, and, and the, the reasons that some people are vulnerable is still not understood. Now, here the neurocognitive effects is a complete wild card. Um, we know that if you take uh, neuronal cells, brain cells, and you put them in a petri dish in the laboratory, and you deliberately expose them to very high levels of testosterone artificially in the laboratory, that the natural life cycle of the cells is accelerated. They, they, they run through their life cycle and die faster than they ought to. And this is known as accelerated apoptosis. Um, but whether, whether um, high levels of testosterone in real human beings would actually have any sort of toxic effect is completely speculative. No one has the slightest idea of whether these laboratory studies would actually translate as, as a possible danger for people. And this is something that we started to look into to see whether there would be any possible effect um, in men who've taken lots and lots of steroids over a long period of time, whether they would be, for example, slightly slower in their reaction time or
might have slightly greater difficulty paying attention and so on. And we're, we're looking at that in, in this study in Middlesbrough. And it's only a, a very preliminary pilot study because there's all kinds of so-called confounding variables that can mess up the picture. You know, if someone has taken other drugs, if someone had too many drinks last night, if someone is sleep deprived, your, your level of education, level of baseline intelligence, there are numerous confounding variables. So that this is only sort of a, a very uh, preliminary study that, that we'll look at. And then if it looks like there's any possibility that there might be something there, then we would go back and try to get some serious money uh, from Uncle Sam and, uh, and come back and do a really proper study with 200 study subjects and with careful control of all of these various confounding variables. So again, many of these questions, if there's one message to take home from this whole lecture, it's, it's actually how little we actually know, uh, that, that, that we still are, are groping towards the answers to many of these questions. And we just don't really know this early in the game what it might be. But, but let, me, let me conclude with sort of a worst case scenario, if you will. Um, remember, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, that widespread use of steroids did not really appear until about 1980 in America and maybe 1990 here. So therefore, the great majority of, and uh, this slide says illicit steroid use, because of course in my country it is illicit to possess steroids, even though it's, it's legal to possess them uh, in the UK. But the, the oldest of these steroid users, men who first took steroids, uh, say in 1985 or 1990, when they were 20 years old, are still now only 40 or 45 years old. So that the vast majority of steroid users are, are below middle age or only just now entering middle age. And so we don't know over the next 20 years what uh, risks, uh, what things might surface. And again, as I said, just to take a worst case scenario, imagine hypothetically that widespread cigarette smoking did not arise until the 1980s or 1990. And that the vast majority of cigarette smokers were still in their 30s with a few into their 40s as of today. In that, in that scenario, you might see the occasional case report of someone with lung cancer, the, the odd report of someone who developed emphysema at a young age. But we'd have no idea of what was about to hit us in that scenario. So we have to, there, there is the fear that there might be some long-term effects of steroids and that it's really too early to call. So that this remains an area of some anxiety uh, as, as to what the future may bring. And by about 10 years from today, we'll have many more answers than we possess currently. Thank you.